Hey everyone, and welcome back to Country Music Made Me. Thank you so much for joining us once again. If you haven't already, please be sure to check us out on social media. We're available on all platforms. So just head over, search Country Music Made Me and give us a follow. You can also find us at countrymusicmademe.com where you can sign up for our newsletter to receive exclusive content. On today's episode, we are excited to be welcomed by Anna Voss. Now, Anna grew up inspired by music partly because of her dad, Steve Voss, who was also known as Buck Howdy, a Grammy award-winning children's country musician. Now, throughout the years, Anna began songwriting in her youth, recording music in her teenage years, and after high school, she headed off to Belmont University to study songwriting. She graduated in 2018 and really hit the ground running, building a career in music. She released her debut EP, California Kid, shortly after graduation. And throughout 2020 and into 2021, she worked with super producer Luke Laird on her EP, Wild Honey, which was released last May. She is set to release her new EP on September 30th, Younger Version of Myself. So please enjoy our conversation with Anna Voss. I saw a post at one point when people ask, have you always loved country? And your answer is, um, yep, raised on, with, by, and wearing it. All of the above, (laughs) a country girl through and through. And within that, I mean, let's talk about one of your biggest musical inspirations, your dad off the top and, and just what he meant to this career. Buck Howdy was his stage name. He was a children's performer, a children's country performer when you were growing up. And so talk about that experience and what that was like for you and having a dad that was a performer. And obviously that meant he was away from home, I imagine quite a bit, touring and going to Nashville. So what did those experiences mean to this whole endeavor of being a musician? Yeah, so I think... First, you know, when I was like a kid, I I only ever knew my dad as a performer and my mom was a journalist. So she was oh, okay. on TV as a reporter. So my concept of like my mom and dad go to work was very strange because, you know, my mom's like reporting on San Diego News and, and my dad is on tour. Um, so I think the biggest impact that had on me immediately was like, there are no rules here. You know, we can like, there's no, like you have to go and major in business and you have to go do this thing. Um, in a very traditional sense, nothing was traditional. And I think watching my dad, like do a lot of the stuff that I'm doing now in my career, um, it continues to unfold to me what an impact that had. Um, I remember he would have people over to his studio at our house to co-write and he was on tour and he was leaving for, you know, three weeks at a time. And um, so I was just around, I think, the culture of music and entertainment really early on in my life. And it was really fun. I saw the hard work that it took. I saw the, the best parts of it. And I think the worst parts of it, too, of like, dang, like you know, it is a sacrifice to go out on the road for three weeks when you have two little kids or work long hours where a lot of my friends, moms were stay at home moms. And so I was, you come home and you're hanging out with your brother, you're going to an after school program. So I think the biggest impact was definitely just understanding the culture of it. Um, Musically, my dad was a children's country artist and it was very inspired by, um, like Hee Haw, Johnny Cash, Pete Seeger, that world. Right. So I was exposed to very traditional country music, but at the same time, the the radio was always on the country station. KSON 92.1 was the station. And we would always just be listening. It's what I would wake up to in the morning. So um, I think his taste in music just kind of bled into mine um, very naturally. Right. And now you grew up in California near San Diego, but I saw you talk about a, like a summer home or a cottage that you had in Headwaters, Virginia, 
where you did a lot of your growing up. But those two places yes. are not exactly close together. <laughs> they are basically no. on opposite sides of the country. So what did that look like in going back and forth to those two places? Was there a lot of driving or a lot of flying? A lot of flying. Um, so I actually was just there this this past year. Um, or past year (laughs) this past week um whoa need more caffeine (laughs) um yeah so we we would fly um and even that was still a really long travel day because you're flying san diego to usually like dulles airport and that's five hours and then it's about a three hour drive to headwaters so it's a really long day especially as children um yeah sure my parents loved that but we would go, there's no cell service. There's no internet. I mean, you are on off the grid. Uh, there's about maybe 10 people that live in this town that our farmhouse is, is at. And, and you would just get there and have to figure out what to do that didn't involve the TV that didn't involve like video games. Like my parents really just said to my younger brother and I like, have fun, go (laughs) do whatever. Um, and what, a quote that I'm going to misquote is like, um, bore, out of boredom comes some of the best like creativity. And I think that really became such an inspirational place as a kid because you literally have nothing to do. So you like can only sit around for so long before you're like, well, I guess I'll pick up the guitar and I'll write a song. And for my brother, it was like, I guess I'll, you know, write a short story or I'll, I'll make a film with my little digital camera. Um, and I think it just gave both of us the space to be creative and um, totally explore that world of creativity with no time limits whatsoever. So, yeah. Right. And talk about the sunroom at that in that home and how inspirational that has been for you over the years and continues yeah. to be for you in your songwriting. You're good. I have to say, you're incredible. I listened to some other episodes that you did. I was like, he goes so deep. (laughs) Wow. Um, Yeah. It's like, honestly, what it comes down to is like the acoustics in that room are like nothing I've ever experienced before. So you sing anything in there and you're like, I think I'm in an arena right now. Like, it just feels like so good. Um, Right. And so you just want to sit in there and play guitar and sing and write songs. And that was kind of the space that like, I felt like I could, you know, close myself off of from the rest of the house and the rest of my family and just kind of hole up and, and write songs. So, uh, yeah, anytime I go, I'm like, okay, you're going to go to the sunroom. And, you know, my parents know they're like, go to the sunroom. Uh, so yeah. That's awesome. And another inspiration within your life I wanted to ask about is the 66 Mustang and yes. what that means to you and if it's still around if that's still within the family oh yeah so that was my mom's first car oh wow um yeah my my granddad uh is is very into cars um especially classic cars and so that was their first car at the time it was like not cool which now i'm like this is the coolest car in the world my mind is blown yeah um but they my grand, my grandparents live in Denver. That's where my mom was raised. And we, when we were kids, we would visit them and my granddad would drive us around in this Mustang. And early in high school, he was like, you know, when we live in Denver, we can drive this for three months out of the year. You guys live in San Diego. Like this car belongs somewhere. It's always sunny. Right. And so he, he and my Grammy drove this Mustang out to San Diego no AC. It's the loudest car you've ever been in. Like there's no, it's not glamorous when you get inside. Right. Um, but they drove it out and it's just been in, in our, our family, um, for a really long time. And I, I've moved to Nashville now and I have lived here for a while. So I don't, I didn't have a car when I would go home and all my friends still live in San Diego. So I'm like, Hey, can you pick me up? And then one day my mom was like, well, you can take the Mustang. And that's just kind of become my, my vehicle when I get home. So it, it reminds me of home. Home is very important and special to me. So it's just, it makes me feel like I'm home and it's also a blast to drive around in with the top down. So it's inspired a lot of um, music. It's also the way that 
I like to test out like new songs where I'll either put like a Bluetooth speaker, or, like I'll put one of my AirPods in and I'll drive around in it and listen to a new song. And um, with this new EP that I have coming out, I happened to get a mix of one of the songs, Take It Easy On Me, while I was home. And so I was like, I know what I'm going to do and uh, got in the car and drove to the beach and listened to that song and it, it passed the test. So that's, that's awesome. That's the six or six months thing. Yeah. Awesome. And that grandpa who had the car, I don't know if this is the same grandpa I'm going to ask about, but I have to ask about this grandpa because you've talked about him in his younger years. He was a gangster working alongside Mickey Cohen until he walked into a Billy Graham crusade in Los Angeles and found God and basically changed his life. Tell him, is that the same grandpa? It is not. Um, That would be too much power for any human to have, I think. (laughs) Um, That is my dad's dad. I never really got to know him that well, but I feel like um, I know him just because he inspired like some my uncle, um, one of my uncles is a historian and so has done a lot of research on, on my grandpa, Jim. And, um, it, he's, it's just, a. I think I was raised Presbyterian and, and still, am, um, spiritual and my family is very faithful. And so his story was very much, um, a story that was shared with all of the kids and cousins and, you know, um, in-laws and all that, just because, it was a really amazing story of this guy who was so lost and, you know, really in trouble with the law and then found miraculously stumbled into this um, crusade. So crazy uh, that my grandma, I love to bake and my grandma made these cookbooks um, that she just made several copies of for our whole family. And one of the recipes I was going through one day was Mickey Cohen's peach pie. And I was like, hold on, dad, what, what is this? And he was like, oh yeah, this is a peach pie. Like sometimes we would uh, take it, like bake it for him and take it to him while he was in prison. Oh, wow. <laughs> I was like, okay, good to know. Um, so I haven't made it yet, but oh wow, it, there's always time. <laughs> That's amazing. And within your musical influence, tell me about Glenn Campbell and Rhinestone mm. Cowboy and the influence that that album has had on your life ever since hearing it yeah uh glenn campbell i just i picture him as a happy guy and his music is so like romantic sonically romantic it's very like that like western world um so just from like the branding standpoint of it i'm a geek about that kind of thing i love like the album cover and the outfits he would wear and like the guitars that he would play Um, But aside from that, like, it's so melodic. It's so different than what country music feels like now. Right. That when I heard it for the first time, Gentle on My Mind, like, rocked my world. Um, So, yeah, I just, I love him. He's great. Um, And he also, like, played with the Beach Boys a a good bit. And I love the Beach Boys. So stumbling upon that on YouTube was one of one of the greatest encounters. <laughs> That's awesome. And with your music, I know you it's very personal and you always try to put emotion behind it for the listener. And I wanted to talk about sort of that emotion through music and how long you have felt that for, especially while watching Taylor Swift sing Mean at the Grammys around 2010 ish. Yeah. <laughs> You're so um yeah I just I mean I was a really big Taylor Swift fan growing up like she was like the only female artist at the time that was like almost my age and singing things on country radio that I was like I do feel that way because in in some songs you know like I love to jam to like Redneck Yacht Club but I didn't really know what they were talking about I was like I'm not I don't know what this means I don't live you know um but when someone is on the radio singing like, oh, this boy in my math class doesn't, you know, have the same feelings for me. I'm like, I heard that. Definitely heard that. Um, so like I, see, being a fan of Taylor um, and then seeing her perform on the Grammys and she changed these lyrics to say someday I'll be singing this at the Grammys. And I I was just so like impacted by that because I 
I felt like she was someone I, I, I could see myself in her, you know, as just like a young girl who had feelings and only knows how to process her feelings through writing a song. Um, and I think she really, she and Casey Musgraves really, really set this blueprint for me of like just holding a conversation in a song and writing songs as though it's a conversation with whoever the song is for. And sometimes it's for my heart and sometimes it's for a boy that broke my heart. Um, and yeah, so she really set the tone for that for me. Right. And within this career, tell me about, I think it was senior year and saving this kiss. I think it was your first music and what that meant sort of within this progression of you as an artist. And at that time, were you focused on a career in music? I was. Um, I, I'm trying to think of the exact timeline, but probably when I was a sophomore in high school, I was really starting to look at what college looked like. And I played lacrosse in high school. Um, it was a very competitive comp program that I was in. So I was looking at, okay, well, do I go and play lacrosse in college? So many of my teammates are looking at that. And all of that happened so early in high school, which is crazy. Right. But I had to really weigh my priorities and what I saw myself doing for the next however many years. And it always came back to music. Um, and so having parents in the entertainment industry was really helpful in that moment because, you know, my dad would say, okay, well, play me a song you just wrote or play, you know, let's go do a demo of this song. And, and we would go and go into a studio in San Diego and record with amazing musicians. And I just oh, okay. had access to opportunities that I don't think I would have had otherwise. And so that allowed me to have recordings of songs and edit my songs and critique them. And um, when I was looking at colleges, I found Belmont University, which they had a songwriting program. They still do. It's fantastic. Um, but you had to submit three songs to apply. And it's a super competitive program. Like at the time they let in, I think, 12 kids. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. So it was like, okay, if we're going to do this, like we got to do it. And so my dad um, just took me into the studio and we recorded, I think it was four songs. Um, and Saving This Kiss was one of them. And so, yeah, this like I had this bundle of songs that I was like, well, I want to put it out on iTunes. So, you know, you get on CD, baby, or wherever and upload yeah. it um, and put it out in the world. It probably had 37 streams total. Um, but it was really cool to me to like go through that process. Now I'm like, oh, God, that's terrifying. Those songs are those songs are terrifying to listen to. But um, my high school friends definitely still send me screenshots when when it comes up in their shuffle in their library. So right. someone's streaming it. <laughs> and within a musical career, was school big for your parents or was it big for you? Like, was there any thought of just heading to Nashville to see what would happen within a career and not and, and skipping the college part of things? That was not an option, um, which like I'm really grateful because to me, like education is absolutely a privilege. Um, but yeah, my, my parents and my grandparents made it very clear that you were going to go to college. You were going to get a college education. You can major in whatever you want. Um, but it's always nice to have a degree in case, you know, something hits the fan. And so I went and I majored in songwriting and music business at Belmont and um learned a lot so it was a really nice like mix of like going to nashville and getting to do the thing as though i was just moving there without college but also having a community of people doing the same thing as me um it was great it was kind of the best of both world both worlds right and what was that trip like from san diego to nashville because you had made you had flown that trip many times going to headwaters but making that trip to nashville was that a different feeling than you've ever had sort of making that trip across the country yeah well it's always weird anytime you're traveling and it's a one-way ticket you know because it's just like all right we'll see what happens and so that was so strange we're like i'm like this is not a there's not a return flight to san diego on this this trip right um and I don't think it hit me until my parents' car pulled away that I was like, oh, 
I'm pretty far from home right now. Uh, so that it was very surreal for sure. It still is like, it's crazy to be far away from my family and like the only place I've ever lived in really. Um, yeah. And tell me about Megan Watt and room 117 and the memories <laughs> that you have. She's going to be so stoked. Um, she is one of my best friends. Megan and I uh, were roommates freshman year at Belmont. And I don't know what to say about Megan other than like, she is just the biggest cheerleader of the people around her. And so in any situation, like there's, you know, rights that I've had coming up that I'm really excited about or signing a publishing deal or releasing a record. She's like the cheerleader for, um, but she's also the friend that like, I can be so weird with like my boyfriend and her fiance are both like, this is strange. You two, like, this is a unique bond that the two of you have. Um, but she's just been someone to me that I think, I've known since literally day one of being in Nashville and to have really like grown together. I mean, she's getting married soon. Um, I have a cat, so that's pretty big for me. <laughs> like, we really just have like been with each other through the changes and I, it's, it's taught me so much about um, the value of, of long-term friendship and um, sticking with each other through the awesome highs and the, the not so awesome lows because there are many of both yeah and also to be able to laugh through it at the end of the day <laughs> and within your belmont experience talk about in 2016 and winning the women's creators scholarship that was created by miranda lambert and you won that and you seem like a very sort of easygoing bubbly person but i read that within that experience that was something that maybe made you a little more competitive than many experiences do. Yeah, it was. Um, I'm like, I would say thank you for saying that I am easygoing and bubbly because my therapist would be so proud. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I would say I'm I'm usually a go with the flow person, but I, I also have this like borderline anxiety, like all the time of like, am I doing enough? Am I like checking enough boxes? Like, Oh, right. And with that, that was something that I, when I have a goal, it is like head down. Like my mom likes to call me a bulldozer a little bit sometimes where I just like full force go for something. And when that scholarship was announced, I was like, okay, we're going to do it. We're going to apply for it. And the way that they would um, notify you was like, Hey, you made it down to the final 30. We'll get back to you in a month. And then it was, hey, you made it to the final 15. And at that point, you're like, okay, so that person is still, you know, and you're like, kind of like, it's awful. But like, right. you're, you're sussing out the field because you're like, this someone's paying for my college and, and it's Miranda Lambert. And that's incredible. Um, yeah. And then it was down to the final three. And it was like radio silence for probably two months. So at that point, I assumed I didn't get it. Um, I, I was literally having stress dreams where like it was being announced. My, my professor, Drew Ramsey, who I love, I had a dream that he was like, and the scholarship goes to Anna Voss. I'm so sorry. I read the wrong name. Like La La Land did the Oscars. Right. And I was so stressed. And then I got a call from the Dean of the Curb College one day. And he was like, you were selected for the scholarship. And I cried and I ran out to my dad's studio and office space. And I was like, oh, we did it. And it was one of the most like extreme moments of joy I've ever experienced after a lot of stress. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And now within that moment, and then like you graduated in 2018, right? Yeah. Okay. So you had that scholarship win in 2016. And then I believe I also saw that you opened for Hunter Hayes um, at the yeah. San Diego Fair in 2016. You signed with Black River Entertainment in 2017. So you had these experiences throughout college. So were you confident when you graduated that this was the career for you and that these little experiences that had happened during college were going to help sort of push you forward when you graduated? Yeah, I think um, experiences aside, I was just like, yeah, I, this is what I'm 
going to do. Like right. I don't, not, I don't have an option, but my heart doesn't have an option in this. Um, so I think if I had graduated with absolutely nothing going on and three different people telling me like, you should probably go home, <laughs> I would have been like, cool, I'm going to give it a few years. Thanks right. though. Um, but I certainly graduated I mean, with, with a team of people around me that I, I had never really had before other than my family, um, helping me navigate the industry, um, when I was very fresh into it. So that was a huge vote of confidence for myself. And just like, I know that I can go into this person's office and talk to them about what I'm experiencing or like what I should be doing. And it can give me a little more guidance than, than just my head can. <laughs> right. Yeah. And now you played the Belmont country showcase, I believe mm -hmm. maybe it was your final year. I saw you mention that it had been like three years in, in a row of hearing no. And then finally yes. you were able to take part in it. Now I wanted to ask about that experience and what that has shown you in never taking no for an answer and never <laughs> letting a door shut in your face without knocking on it and pounding on it a few times. Yeah. Yeah. It was such a, a lesson to me in the timing of things. Um, I want things to work out on the first try every time, but with country showcase, for whatever reason, there were incredibly talented people at Belmont auditioning that, that would get these showcases. And so I would go in and like, all right, here we go. And here's my vision. And like every year, like I would make a really big deal about like asking the the players of the band to like play with me and audition. And I'm like, here's what we're wearing. Here's what we're blah, blah, all the stuff. And we go in and I'm like, this is the year. And then you get a no. Yeah. Um, and I think it being like my senior year and getting to do that, it was a really cool culmination of my college experience. Um, but it just was a reminder that like you just got to do it if you if it's what you believe you should do and i think even like in walking away from that experience um knowing that that's not the only no i'm going to get and sometimes no doesn't even look like a no it's just a not yet and having to remind myself of that like I definitely forget all the time, um, but I can look back at certain moments like that or shows I didn't get, get chosen to play or, or what, whatever it is. Like I can look back at some of those concrete pieces of evidence and say, okay, well, just because this person didn't believe in, in my career or my artistry at that moment doesn't mean they can't change their minds and say yes later. Right. Yeah. And Perseverance. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's what you've had. And so you graduated in 2018 and now we'll skip ahead a bit. You released your debut music in 2018 as well. And then 2020 hit. And as a newer artist, what was that year like? Because you did spend a bit of the year in the studio recording new music, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was crazy. So 2020, I mean, it was crazy for everyone. Um, what it looked like for me was the beginning of the year. I mean, within the first week of 2020, I was opening some shows for Willie Nelson. I had like reached out to my dream producer, Luke Laird, and, and had asked him like, hey, would you produce this project that I'm starting to think about? And there were all these green lights that felt like this huge opening of the door. Um, and then obviously COVID happens. Yeah. And the recording date gets pushed back and the shows stop and all of that. And late in July, I got to go in and record the music in terms of what that did for, for the wild honey EP was it actually gave me a lot of time to sit with the, the pre-production of it. Oh, okay. And like, I, I like would journal about things and just like make little demos and stuff like that, that at the time felt like it was just taking up space. Um, but when I went into the studio, I was able to like play my little demo for the players and that heavily influenced uh, what the final recording sounded like. So that, that was really cool. Um, and then also like TikTok, like I just started posting on TikTok and um, I enjoy social media when I feel like 
no one that I know is like watching what I post because I'm like, yeah, this is pretty embarrassing or like pretty weird. But no one I know is going to see this. And so there was like this pocket of time on TikTok where I was just posting stuff for fun um, and actually like gained a bit of traction. I um, I decided I was going to prank call The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon as like a fake publicist and, and try and get on the show. Yep. <laughs> and so... Yeah, that was a wild ride. Um, and so, what, yeah, what, it just be, was... before you skip past that, where is that at? Because you tried it with <laughs> Ellen as well. So, with both of those, are you still going down that path, or has it sort of ended? So, um, with Ellen, I was like, I'm just gonna eat it and see what happens because they were on like their last season, right? Which has now ended. Oh, okay. Um, so, yeah. So, and I never like they are like. Uh, an ironclad institution because I was not able I mean I was not successful in that at all um and then I just kind of like fell into feeling like you know it, it was basically picking up the phone and being rejected as many times as I picked up the phone and right. so after a while I was like this isn't that fun um and I I wanted to like I, new music was coming out so I was like okay I want to like take a minute and have a serious moment to say this is the music I have been working on and right. like it, I, I I'm not just like oh, oh, oh let me see if I can get on to Jimmy Fallon um but it was really fun and I I now have Lauren Michaels number which he's probably changed since then but <laughs> On while it lasted. <laughs> That's amazing. And I wanted to ask you about I'm just a girl in a bar. When you released the little teaser for that, you were crying a little bit and you were trying to get through listening to the song. And so was that just because of the emotions of finally releasing this music that you had put so much work into over 2020? It was like kind of all of the above of like, I think as a songwriter, you, we, we all have this ability. Like, it's like, we never get over our emotions. Like they're all just like stored away nicely until you're like, whoo, like, dang, I still feel that even though that was five years ago. Right. Um, and so it was kind of mix a mixture of that of like, I can't believe this music is coming out. It's, it's a song that I wrote with one of my favorite songwriters produces one of my favorite producers and um, also just like heartbreak and like what the song, you know, it, it feels like to me, which is so many like unrequited love experiences of like, Oh, this awkward tension. Um, so yeah, that's girl in a bar. That's awesome. And now we have a new EP coming out next Friday, September 30th. Now tell us about this project and how it's come together. Is it Luke again, who was working with you on this one? Yeah. So the EP is called the younger version of myself and it's five songs. And um, Luke, Luke and I co-produced the EP and then Mark Trussell um, also came in and co-produced a few songs as well. Didn't even date. Um, and how about that? Mark, Mark produced. So it's, I mean, it just like is a very honest experience um, as a young woman. I think younger version of myself is uh, a song that I wrote about some struggles and challenges that I went through in navigating um, the the physical parts of being a woman and comparing yourself and standing in, in front of the bathroom mirror and wishing you look different. Um, but also just some of the mental struggles too, of like feeling, yeah, just, just, I think not giving yourself or myself like the grace to take up as much space as, um, is, is as a person is allowed to, um, in the human conversation. So that song's very scary to sing live. It feels very honest. It's probably the most honest on the EP. There's some feel good ones. Take it easy on me is just like windows down, driving to the beach kind of song. Didn't even date. How about that? And kind of don't ever are all um, very honest. Also, they're they're kind of different parts of a relationship that I went through. And yeah, it just feels like an honest, like 
I, I call it like a love song to a younger version of myself because there's these versions of me that all experience this in real time that I think would have benefited by listening to these songs and having like a little buddy to help them through. So gave that, yeah, to myself and hopefully it resonates with other people too. Right. And did the production process look a little different because maybe you didn't have the same amount of time you had on the last EP to work through it? Was it a a little quicker process and a little different? Yes. Um, So I, during the summer of 2021, was on a backyard tour. Right. Yeah. And it it was every weekend from May, middle of May to middle of August. And then we got back um and I like two days later recorded, went into the studio and recorded this EP. Oh wow. So I really it was such a practice in like relying on the skills of the people around you who are absolutely so skilled and talented. But like I feel like I had to let some of the control of production go and just let the song be what it was because I didn't have the time to do the the pre-production of pages and pages of journaling and like little like branded documents and say, here's what happens in the chorus. It was really just like, okay, what does this song need to be? And um, I felt like connected to the process in a different way because I feel like I focused on different aspects of it um, than I did with the Wild Honey EP. And so, so much more has been done on after the creation of it in like the music videos that we've recorded and some, some of the graphic design um, that I've done for it. I've just dug in more on like that world of it. And that's made me feel connected to it in a way that I didn't think I, I would. Um, so yeah, look, definitely look different. That's awesome. But was it made easier because you were working with someone like Luke, who is a amazing producer and the fact that you did have that time in the studio in 2020 where he probably got to know you and who you were and what you wanted through your music and so even though you weren't maybe there for this EP as much he probably had a good feel for what you would want as a musician absolutely oh my gosh he he is like like I feel like watching him work is like watching a master class because he just is so good at what he does but he does it in such like a kind and but professional way at the same time um and so like it was so easy to just put my trust in him um because I know that he knows me and we had done the wild honey EP together um but also I know that like we have a lot of the same influences and like we both love some of that traditional country but there's like the early 2000s country that like is like a guilty pleasure also and so just to be able to like let it really like rest in in his hands um was was really easy to do because you're like heck yeah it's Luke Laird of course yeah exactly that's awesome now I want to end on a on a few fun things now I want you to tell me uh the story behind some other peeps and their (laughs) hits I don't feel good about that. And and back to school. (laughs) Yes. Um, My friend, Alyssa Newton, who's an amazing artist and writer. uh, We went to the farmhouse, which is in Virginia. And we, again, boredom, out of boredom comes the greatest creativity. And we were like, what if we just made a rap? And so we recorded this rap. We had logic uh, on our computers that we like recorded it into. And then filmed a music video and posted it. And we've done it a few times. And we just have fun. Like, we're both, like, we're we're goofy, goofy people. And that inspired some other peeps. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And within your phone calls to Ellen and Jimmy Fallon, and you, you had a thing on your last EP where if people pre-saved it, you would prank call one of their exes. And you had this alter ego, Donna Donatello. Now, I wanted to ask where that came from, where that was developed from, and how long you've been playing that character. So I have always, since I was a kid, like I've loved accents. I will like slip into a British accent sometimes when I just, I don't know why. Um, And uh, I guess I just like 
started doing a New York accent as a joke. And I I knew like, okay, like if I'm going to have a publicist, like in Friends, if you watch the show Friends, it's one of my favorites. Um, Phoebe pretends to be Joey's agent at one point. Right. Um, and she's like, I, I forget her name. Um, but I'm sure deep in my subconscious, like that's what I was like doing. Um, and I was like, well, I need a, I need a New Yorker name, you know? So Donna Donatello came to be, and it's a fun time. I, yeah. Um, very fun. She's a, she's a, a loosey goosey lady and who knows when she will reappear. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And you're heading out on tour tomorrow, um, for a run of dates. And now within this career and your last EP and now you're getting set to release a new EP you're heading out on tour we've come out of the pandemic and it feels like you're you're moving ahead stronger than ever and so as you look back on the last couple of years and and where you're headed what do you sort of see as the future and what do you think of of where you've come over the last couple of years Mm. I think for the future I my goals are arena tour. It's probably number one goal. Um, an album. I look forward to the day. I feel like I have to earn making an album a little bit um, in this world that we're in of, of singles and yeah. streaming. Um, so that's something I really look forward to. And I think the most, the thing that like pushes me forward and that, that keeps me going in writing songs and making music and spending time on social media is the relationship I have with my fans and the people that listen to my music. And right. so I just look forward to what, what that relationship continues to look like. Um, I have lots of dreams for things that we all get to do together. And um, that's kind of my goal is to just go through it with the people that, um, are willing to come alongside me. I consider them friends and look forward to when we get to scream songs that a lot of people haven't heard yet in, in an arena together. So that's my goal. Looking back, I think I'm really proud of the work that I put in during the pandemic. I think it was really healthy creatively. It was a good balance of, of breath, but also creation. And I think there are times where like that younger version of myself would be like, what are we doing? We're supposed to be on a world tour right now. Right. We're way behind. But I know I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. And um, I'm, I'm proud of myself for like growing into that mindset versus being like, all right, let's go, people. <laughs> Is that a difficult so, mindset yeah. to stay within? Oh yeah. You, you could ask any of the people around me and they'd be like, "Mm, but Tuesday you were crying. (laughs) I'm like, well, it's a flow state. You know, you gotta, it goes in and out. It's a blessing when you have it and it sucks when you don't, but you know, it's coming back around. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. That's awesome. Well, September 30th, the new EP, the title again, let us know. Younger version of myself. Younger version of myself. Awesome. And you have, like I say, a string of tour dates. And then is there plans for anything more or are things kind of winding down heading into the fall and winter season as they do? I've got some like fun, fun things in the works. Um, But I think I'm going to dig in this fall and work on some new music that I'm so excited about. And that's really exciting to me. So winding down from from being out in the world, but definitely working on new stuff. That's awesome. Well, I'll let everyone know if they want to have a good time to head over to your social media, especially your TikTok, because I I can't get enough of the video, like your honesty and Donna Donatello and just everything you do. Like I was looking the other day and I'm like, why is this not viral? like your whole account because you're amazing on there and you should have so much more, but I'm sure that it'll come as you continue to (laughs) provide us with this awesome content. Thank you. That means a lot. That, That really does. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you once again so much for listening. And thank you to Anna for stopping by and sharing her story. Be sure to check out her new EP, Younger Version of Myself, when it's released on September 30th. Please also be sure to check us out on social media. We're available on all platforms. So just head over, search Country Music Made Me and give us a follow. You can also visit us at countrymusicmademe.com where you can sign up for our newsletter to receive exclusive content. And finally, if you enjoyed today's episode, please leave us a review or a rating. It would be a great help and much appreciated. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time on Country Music Made Me. 